the doors back here for me, please. Appreciate it. We're talking today, Pastor's talking today about the trumpet and the sounding of the trumpet. So what a better song to sing than when the roll is called up yonder, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. Let's sing, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of us shall gather over on the other shore, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their own beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. Till setting sun, let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we could spend together. Thank you that we still, in this country, have the opportunity to worship you um, right now in, in our church. Father, we ask that you be with us this morning, speak to hearts, speak to young hearts, Speak to the elder hearts, speak to the middle-aged hearts, just speak to us, Holy Spirit, that we might understand what you have for us today from the book of the Revelation. God, God, direct everything that's said and done in this service that you will get all the glory and the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So Great and your heart. 
Young people sing really good on this song because this is uh, their voices are younger than ours and they can really get it on with this song. So we're going to let them take the biggest part of this song. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. Ooh. I raise a hallelujah with everything out of me. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the mystery, I raise a hallelujah. In fear you lost your hold on me. I'm gonna sing. 
sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder, louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. Sing a little louder. Louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive.
children, you are dismissed. For those of you who were not aware, Fred's pathology report came back, and he is all clear. He still has some restrictions. He can't carry more than five pounds, so brother, you're going to need to put that tissue down. Yeah. Hey, listen, yesterday uh, was Star Wars Day. But it was also Madison Aker's birthday, and she had a healthy baby boy. His name is Eutychus. No, it's not. His name is Judson Dean Akers, 8 pounds, 5 ounces, 21 inches long. So I talked to her this morning and congratulated her from us, um, but keep them in your prayers. Uh, they're supposed to be coming home today. Uh, so, uh, Revelation chapter 8 in your Bibles. Revelation chapter 8. How long? How long is the question that was asked in chapter 7, uh, in chapter 6? How long, Lord, in chapter 6 was, was the question, how long will we have to wait until you take care of business? How long? How long until... Things will happen. That's a question we ask a lot of times. How long is this going to take? Right? How long? How long do I have to deal with this? How long? How long does it take to put together a file cabinet bought by our daycare? She's not here. How long is this sermon? About six days. How long? Listen to these verses in Scripture, so, and I, I've got them all up there, so you don't have to write them, uh, write down the nothing but the reference, and all of them are in Psalm except for one. Psalm chapter 4, verse 2. It's coming. How long will the wicked dishonor the Messiah and love what is worthless and seek lies? How long, Psalm 6, 1 through 3, how long until we are healed and no longer do things that provoke God's wrath? Psalm 13, 1 and 2, how long will it seem like God has forgotten us and is hiding his face while the enemy exalts over us? Psalm 35, verse 17, how long will the Lord look on before he delivers? Psalm 62, verse 3, how long will the righteous be attacked? Psalm 74, verse 10, how long will the enemies of God scoff and revile his name? Psalm 79, verse 5, how long will God's anger against his people who have sinned continue? Psalm 80, verse 4, how long will God refuse to answer the prayers of his people? Psalm 90, verse 13, how long before the Lord returns and has pity on his servants? Psalm 94, verse 3, how long will God allow the wicked to exalt? And gloat. Psalm 119, verse 484, how long must God's servants endure persecution? Revelation 6, 9 and 10. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held, and they cried with a loud voice, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. How long? We kind of know what that feels like, don't we? How long? How long must I suffer with this painful disease? How long until God remakes the world so that no more babies are murdered before they're born? or are born with some sort of debilitating disease? How long must I struggle with this temptation? How long, God? 
until redemption comes? How long until this suffering ends? How long until God shows his glory and puts those who mock him to shame? How long? And that question has been ringing through the prayers of God's servants, saints, for thousands of years. How long, God? How long? What do you think it's going to look like when God decides it's time? Look back at chapter 6, verse 11. It says, And a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. So both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. In chapter 8, we're going to see that those prayers will be answered. God is going to answer them. And in chapter 8, it's going to meet four needs that we have. These are needs that we often overlook. First one is this. We often uh, need to be reminded and need to have encouragement to keep on praying. Sometimes it's easy to watch the news and to see all the things that are happening in our world and say, what good is prayer? But in encouragement to us, we need to keep on praying. We need to be reminded that God is sovereign. God is in control. God is working out his plan, his plan for salvation. We need to understand that there is a relationship between our prayers and God's plan. Between our prayers and God's plans, and we'll see that today. We'll also see that, uh, secondly, uh, we often fail to make the connection between God's wrath against sin and the ravages of nature. The fact that the <clears throat> world is broken is evidence of God's righteous indig indignation against sin. And we need to understand that. And then thirdly, these judgments, they're going to shout the glory of God. Whether they're the seal judgment, the trumpet judgment, or, or the vial or the bowl judgments, uh, these all shout the glory of God. And the severity of the judgments in chapter 8 are in direct proportion to the glory of the God avenged by these demonstrations of his righteousness and his power. And then the fourth thing is we need to hear that our question, how long, is being answered. It is being answered. In the book of Revelation, we're given the answer. He says, in a, in a little long, just a little longer. Just a little longer. Several years ago, we took a family trip with Lisa's mom and sister, and we went to Italy, um, and we went on a, on, on a tour um, with a company called Globus, and uh, our um, tour guide, her name was Ornella, um, and she spoke broken English, uh, and whenever we would get ready to go see something, she would say, this is just a, a little walk, just a little walk. And we found out that when she said this is just a little walk, it meant at least two miles. This is a little walk. Then she said one day, this is a longer walk. And everybody went, just like that. Oh, how much longer? Oh, just a little longer. <laughs> About six miles walk. Just a little longer. See, our thoughts of just a little walk is about half a mile. Our thoughts of just a little longer are just a few months or a few days, if that, right? I mean, when it comes to food, we don't want to wait a little longer. God says just a little longer. And his idea of just a little longer is a lot different than ours because he told us he was coming back but he didn't tell us when. So it's just a little longer, and he's coming back. Now, the main point we're going to look at today is this. God answers the prayers of his people 
by hallowing his name and judging the world. These trumpet blasts will depict the holiness of God in response to the prayers of his people. So will you stand with me as we read this? Uh, I will read the odd, you read the even off the, the screen or out of the New King James Version. Verse 1, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. <clears throat> then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound the trumpet. Father, I thank you that you've called us here today to worship Lord, it is here we want to make sure that it is always accessible and authentic and powerful. And that because of worship that people are thrilled and excited. Not with worship, but with our Lord Jesus Christ. Where we are focused on him, we are focused on how great you are focused on your holiness and your mercy and your grace more than we are style of worship or anything else. Lord, I pray that you would let Lighthouse be a place where people will run not to be entertained or seen, but to worship you, God, the holy God in spirit and in truth. And that in all things you would be honored and glorified. Father, I pray today that if there's one here who does not know you as their Savior, that today would be their day of salvation. That they would listen to the message that God loves them. He wants no one to perish, but all to come to him. Father, I pray that today you would speak to our hearts and remind us of how great you are. Father, we give you the praise. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. All God's people said, all right, you can be seated. So again, we're just going to give you the reminder of what Dr. Heinsohn said at the beginning of our time that together as we started this book that Dr. Heinsohn said, uh, God has not given us prophecy in his word to scare us, but to prepare us. Um, then uh, the basic outline that we've been going over, uh, the opening of the letter, uh, the John's vision on the Lord's day, and then the closing of the apocalyptic letter um, that we've been looking at, or prophecy. 
who you want to see it, but let's unpack chapter, uh, chapter 8, okay? Um, there are four trumpet blasts that are accompanied by judgments that fall upon the natural world. They're going to fall upon land, sea, rivers, and lights in the heavens, or sun, moon, and stars. Okay, those four things. Let's just start with the basic. Land, sea, rivers, sun, moon, and stars. Who created those? God. Who controls those? God. Who's going to destroy those? God. Um, and they are his to do with what he wants to do with, okay? That is called the sovereignty of God. That, that is what he, we're talking about in sovereignty. There are a lot of people who like try and throw out these ideas of what sovereignty is and predestination and election. Listen, I, God would rather have your heart than your brain, okay? He'd rather you be on fire for Jesus than be a theologian. And I thank God for that. Um, I'm, I, I especially thank God for that because uh, I am not a theologian, uh, but I do love the Lord. There are, there, there's two trumpet blasts that are, we're going to look at in chapter 9 that are um, summoned, uh, that, that come with judgment for man. Um, and when I see these chapters, I see the holiness of God. These trumpet blasts and the events that happen because of them in chapter 8 only happen because God is judging sin. How many think that our world is a mess today? And it's a mess because of politics. Would you agree? I would, I would disagree. It is a mess because of sin. And because of sin, politics and everything else is a byproduct of the sin. You with me? Diseases, hurricanes, tsunamis, tornadoes, out of control fires, every other kind of natural disaster all come as a result of God's judgment against sin. These things are designed so that mankind would fear God and hate sin. But too many times when these things happen, what do man do? They blame God instead of realizing it's their own fault. We, we see here an angel uh, present the prayers of all the saints to God. Uh, and then the trumpets are blown after these prayers rise up before God. God is responding to the prayers of his people. God appoints the ends, and he appoints the means to those ends. And one of the means to the ends that God has appointed is prayer. Prayer. The trumpet blasts show us God's name is holy. In response to the prayers of the saints, as the holiness of God is visited, Upon the natural elements of the created world. God answers the prayers of his people. We, we're going to see in two parts, all right? One, Charlie's already put up there, events before the trumpets blow. The second one will be after the trumpet blows. So let's look at the first five verses. Uh, the first thing is the pause in verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. After the parenthesis, chapter 6, we got the six, the six seals. Chapter 7, there's a parenthesis. Uh, saints are sealed. Uh, and then the seventh seal on the scroll is opened. Again, let's just refresh our memory. Who's opening the seals? Jesus. Why? He's the only one that's worthy. Okay? Uh, so he's going to do this. Now, Habakkuk 2.2 2 says, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Zephaniah 1.7, be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. They have just worshipped God in seven. They've just had a worship service, and they're glorifying him. I don't know about you, but whenever I go to a worship service and I leave there, the first thing I don't do, I, 
first thing I don't do. First thing that keep that I that I the first thing that I what I don't do when I leave there is be silent. Usually what I'm doing is I'm still singing. You go to a concert and what do you do? You're singing the songs over and over and over again. You usually can't hear, so you're just singing the songs because nobody can hear you, so you can't hear yourself. So you're just singing your praise in the Lord. That's what we do. Have you ever tried to sit and be silent? You can't do it. You can't do it. It's not long before we're picking up a phone, turning on TV, putting on some music. Say, Pastor Kevin, you don't understand. I got little kids. Yeah, I do. I've been there. John says, there was silence in heaven. Jesus opens that up. And, and he says, for about half an hour. I don't, I, I, I don't know at that point. I mean, remember, John, John was first century teacher, uh, apostle. I, I don't know how he knew it was a half an hour. I don't know if there's a big clock on the wall. Uh, I, I don't know if he looked at his Timex. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. But whatever it is, there's no sound. The four creatures, the 24 elders, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of angels, you and I who have been called up to heaven in the rapture, we're worshiping him. And all of a sudden, he opens that seventh seal, and there is silence. And we're not told why there's silence. But in those scrolls, what would happen, they would roll them out and they would write on one side. And then they would turn it over and write on the other side. And maybe Jesus got to the end of that seventh slate seal and turned it over. And when he turned it over, everybody saw that and the world was silent. In fear, and in awe of how great God is and what he was about to do, what he's about to accomplish, what his plan actually was, because this is the first time that they've been told what's going on and what's really going to happen, and there is silence. Maybe it's silent because this is just a calm before the storm. Because what's about to take place on earth will be worse than anything we can even imagine. It'll be worse than anything we've seen before. So all of heaven is silent. Then notice verse 2 through 4, he says, I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets, and then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. The seven trumpets are handed out. And significant to John is the fact that these trumpets are handed out because John, for a Jewish person, understood the place of trumpets in Israel's national life. In Numbers chapter 10, trumpets had three important uses. They called the people together. They called the people together. We've told, we're told in 1 Thessalonians uh, that when the rapture takes place, that there will be a trumpet sound. Why is that? Because God is calling his people together. He's calling us up. Um, there are also, uh, we're done to announce special times. This is something significant that's going to take place. Let us blow the trumpets. Also, they were used to announce war. Somebody is attacking us, or we are about to go to war with someone else. The trumpet sounded at Mount Sinai when the law was given. The trumpets were blown when the king was anointed and enthroned. And we all know the story of Joshua and Jericho as they marched around the city blowing their trumpets 
In this case, it is war. God against the rest of mankind. God against Satan and his demons. And so the voice of the Lord Jesus sounded to John like a trumpet, a trumpet voice in John in Revelation chapter four verse one. Summon John to he- to to heaven. The trumpet will the rapture will have a trumpet sounding. Seven trumpets would announce a declaration of war, as well as the fact that God's anointed King was enthroned in glory and about to judge his enemies. The awful silence was founded was followed by the actions of a special angel. Special angel at the golden altar. See that in verse 3. In the tabernacle and in the temple, the golden altar stood before the veil. And the purpose was to burn incense. That was the ministry that Zacharias was performing when he saw the angel in the temple uh, who told him, that he and Elizabeth would have a son, and that son would be John the Baptist, right? So burning incense on the altar then is a picture. It is a picture of our prayers ascending to God. Say, my prayers aren't important. Yeah, they are. Say, my prayers aren't getting answered. Yes, they are. They just may not be answered in what you want, don't want to hear. Because most of the time, there's one thing that we don't want to hear. We can accept yes, gladly. We can accept no, sadly. We cannot accept wait. And a lot of times, God says, wait, wait. The prayers of the saints, not the prayers of a special group of people in heaven who have arrived at sainthood. If you believe in Jesus Christ, and if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and he, the Holy Spirit is indwelling inside of you, you are a saint. It's kind of a scary thing to think about. Saint Fred. You know what's even scarier? Saint Kevin. We don't think of ourselves as saints, do we? We consider ourselves what? Usually sinners. Sinners saved by grace. And that's why we don't live holy lives like we should. Because we're so busy looking at ourselves as sinners and making excuses instead of looking at ourselves the way God sees us. Saints through Jesus Christ. Prayers of the saints are important. We are all to be set apart to God through faith in Jesus Christ. There's no definite teaching in Scripture that people in heaven pray for believers on earth. Did you get that? There's no teaching in Scripture that says your great 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 grandfather is not up there praying for you. That we can direct our prayers to God through them. We pray to the Father through the Son because He alone is worthy. For centuries, Christians have been praying, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. And now these prayers are going to be answered. The tribulation martyrs prayed for God to vindicate them. These are cries for God to uphold His holy law, to vindicate His people. If you have ever been discouraged in prayer and wonder whether your prayers will be answered, John is testifying to you right here in verses 2 through 4 that the answer is yes. God will answer your prayer one day. So prayer is serious business. So we better not move the altar too far from the throne. The preview is given in verse 5. The angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. There were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. On the day, the great day of atonement, the high priest would put incense on the coals in the censer 
and with the blood of the sacrifice. And then he would enter the Holy of Holies. But in this scene, the angel takes the incense on the altar. He puts it on the altar, presented the prayers before God, and then he takes the, the coals, and what does he do with them? He throws them. I don't know if it's overhand or underhand, but he throws them down to where? To earth. What do you think is going to happen when that takes place? Things will start burning up. In Ezekiel chapter 10, Ezekiel chapter 10, this action symbolized God's judgment. And the effects described in verse 6 substantiate this view, which we'll get to in just a minute. Throwing the incense would look like a, a, a massive ball of fire. Okay? A massive ball of fire. Do the, so, so, so the prayers become a symbol of divine wrath, God's wrath. James 5.16 says, The effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Availeth much. God sends this. But he sends it, and along with it comes what? Noises? Thunderings? Lightning? And an earthquake. What's he telling us? That there is a storm brewing. There's a storm brewing. Why? Well, voices or noises noises in some of your Bibles uh, reveals that this is an intelligent direction of God and not the purposeless working of natural forces. In other words, God is in charge, and he is sending his wrath on man. Thunders, it denotes the approach of a coming storm of God's judgment. You hear the thunder off in the distance. Lightnings follow thunder. Is that the way it usually happens? What do we normally see or hear first? Lightning. It's not a reversal of the natural order. We see the lightning before we hear the thundering. Anybody know why? Light moves faster than sound. So the thunder comes first, but we don't hear it until after the lightning comes. I don't know about you guys, but I was taught that you always saw a flash of lightning and you would count 1,001, and then you'd hear the thunder. It was the other way around, isn't it? The earthquake is the earth's response. What's going to happen when this fireball comes to earth with this hat? Have you ever seen the re results of a volcano that has erupted and it spews hot ash into, this, into the air? This is what he's talking about here. Some of the judgments that he's dealing with, Right? So what are the events accompanying the trumpet blowing, verses 6 through 13? Some have compared these to that of the ten plagues of Egypt with Moses. Uh, God judged Egypt in order to deliver Israel, um, and in doing so, God was responded to the prayers of his people. The book of Revelation is showing the ultimate exodus, but this time it is not a nation that God is judging. It is the world that God is judging. It is the wicked world system and all of the people. So as at, at the exodus from Egypt, God is going to judge the wicked world and he is going to deliver his people in response to their prayers. So the fact that God brings on the world these judgments, which so closely relates to the plagues in Egypt, points us to the significance of the deliverance that God is accomplishing through these judgments. So at the like Exodus, when Pharaoh and Egypt refused to repent, these people will refuse to repent. As Pharaoh and Egypt, God is crushing the strong by worldly standards in order to deliver the weak by godly standards. These first four judgments are natural. They said that when you study um, Exodus and you read about the, the ten plagues, that each one of those plagues went against one of the gods of the Egyptians. 
And these first four trumpets are against Mother Nature, the goddess Mother Nature. When I hear that on, t on TV, and it's usually with the weather people, I'm like, Mother Nature, is, I'm like, no, Mother Nature's not doing any of this. It is God Almighty. Um, and and they, they've allowed uh, nature, the world, to become to them a god. There are many today who worship um, their god or goddesses of this, uh, of this world. Uh, this is going to really impact them. Uh, I wonder, you know, if God, God's got a great sense of humor. Um, I wonder if some of these events are going to take place on Earth Day. I, I don't know. So anyway, God's going to bring these world judgments on these people, and it's against the, the land, the, the salt, the, the sea, um, the fresh water, and the heavenly bodies. Uh, the fifth and sixth judgments, which if the Lord tarries, we'll see next week, uh, and it involves the release of demonic forces um, that are going to torment and then kill people. The last of the trumpet judgment creates a crisis among all the nations of the world. So let's go ahead and look at these four. Um, this is a literal judgment, the first one from God upon plant life. Um, look at verse 6. Seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded. Hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. A third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned. So this is um, against plant life. Nexus chapter 9, uh, 18 through 26, you can read about that. It talks about when hail came down and destroyed Egypt. Um, it came down and set fire uh, to, the, to all, of the, all of the fields. It broke every tree in the field. It, it was 100%. It caused 100% destruction in Egypt. This is going to take place, and it's going to impact one third of the earth. This is a, a direct judgment from God. Uh, and judgment is going to fall first of all upon plant life from the grass to the great trees. Every form of botanical life is affected first. Um, notice, however, that is only one third, but it, it makes such a tremendous impact on the earth. Uh, there's fire. Fire is going to be the great enemy. Um, that God is going to use. In Genesis, he used water, and water destroyed the world uh, with the great flood with Noah. And now it's going to be fire. And this earth is the uh, this earth is going to be purified before God by fire. The forest and the prairies that cover the grass are going to be partially burned up. One-third denotes the wide extent of the damage, and one-third means just that, one-third. Plant life uh, was the first to be created in Genesis 1.11, and what is the first thing that God is going to start to destroy? Plant life, what he created. You notice these are all in order, plant life, seawater, rivers. They're all in order. Hail and fire uh, mingled with blood. The prophet Joel said in Joel 2.30, he promised that blood and fire would come in the last days. Since this is a supernatural judgment, it's not necessary to try to explain how hail and fire and blood become mingled. Uh, fire could refer to the lightning of a severe electrical storm. The, the effects of this catastrophic uh, fires will not be just in one area. It will be widespread. It will be devastating, including the destruction of crops, death of animals on a massive scale, loss of wood for construction, and the destruction of waterways. That will be a fitting judgment for those who, according to Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 25, exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. 
fallen man has failed to recognize and honor God as creator, choosing instead to make a God out of the earth. But the environmentalist, the evolutionary pantheologist, pantheist that devalue man, elevates animals and plants, and ignore the creator will be severely judged. In a scorched and ravaged world, there will be little of the environment left to celebrate. And can you imagine the smoke and those who have breathing problems, how it will impact them and the destruction that it will cause? And that is just the first judgment. You can imagine that how this world will affect the balance of nature. When it says trees, one of the one of the things it mentions is the fact that there will be many of those trees that are fruit trees. I don't know about you guys, but I love fruit. I had a banana, strawberries, and, and blueberries this morning. I have an orange and an apple sitting on my desk. I, I think I'm I think I'm in I'm in love with fruit, man. But fruit trees will be gone. And the destruction of pasture land will impact the meat and the milk. Not to mention the oxygen level. What will it do? And that's just the first trumpet. Verse 8. Second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea became blood and a third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. The sea, the salt water, burning ships, uh, marine life, one-third of it will be destroyed. Separation of the land and the sea occurred on the same day in which plant life appeared. Notice the word in there, uh, the word like. John, again, is looking at this through his first century eyes, and he's seeing something and saying, it is like a great big mountain. He's not saying it was a great big mountain, but it was something like that. And so the mountain represents something as literal and tangible as that which Jeremiah talks about. Jeremiah 51, 25, where he says, uh, he's talking about Babylon. He said, behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, who destroys the earth. I will stretch out my hand against you, roll you down from the rocks, and make you a burnt mountain. Now, some believe that this is actually a nation, that God has taken this nation and thrown it down. I don't think that's what it is. I just think it's a literal mass that falls into the seas, falls into the sea, and it causes chaos, causes problems. What would happen if a mass fell into our atmosphere like that? Would some of it break off and go into other portions of sea, the different oceans? I don't, I don't know, possibly. But I know that if a mass as big as a mountain hit the ocean, what would happen? Tsunamis everywhere. A literal mass falls in the sea, and it says that one-third become literal blood, one-third of all the living creatures in the sea. Yeah, that means the dolphins, too. Um, die. Nothing could be plainer than this. Listen to this. In 2023, just one year ago, there were 56,500 merchant ships that were registered by all the nations of the world. 56,500. Think about the one that hit the bridge in Baltimore. 56,500 merchant ships. Also, there were over 7,000 military ships that are registered. Who knows how many there really are. So if one-third of the merchant ships are destroyed, I'll let Fred do the math, and he came up with 18,833.3333. 18,833 merchant ships will be destroyed in one day. 2,334 military ships will be destroyed in one day. Now, those, those numbers aren't, aren't accurate. Don't hold them to me. Don't hold me to them because many of those ships, they may have made more or some of them have already been sunk. But can you imagine what that will look like on our ocean when that many ships are destroyed? 
because of this. Turning water into blood reminds us of Exodus 7, 19 through 21, which is the first plague on Egypt. In other words, he's saying that this is going to be an ecological and economic disaster of unprecedented proportions, considering that the, the oceans occupy three-fourths of the Earth's surface. You can imagine the extent of this judgment. The pollution of the water and the death of so many creatures would greatly affect the balance of life in the ocean. Third trumpet, verse 10 through 11. The angel sounded, the third angel sounded, a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on the third of the rivers on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters become Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. One third of the fresh waters are going to be poisoned. It will kill many people by falling. Uh, by this falling object known as bitterness or wormwood. We live in a world where a great deal is being said about pollution. In the great tribulation, the fresh water is going to be polluted, and the drinking water is going to become contaminated. The worm, wor, wormwood is a name used metaphorically in the Old Testament in three ways. First of all, to describe the idolatry of Israel. Secondly, to talk about the calamity and sorrow of man. And thirdly, false judgment. This star is a literal star. More than likely, it could be a, a meteor. It contains poison, which contaminates one-third of the Earth's fresh water supply. The star name suggests that this is a judgment upon man for idolatry and injustice. Calamity and sorrow will be the natural rewards that come upon man because of their sin. The word translated wormwood gives us our English word absinthe, which is a green liqueur having a bitter anise or, anise or licorice flavor and a high alcohol content. My mom and my aunt used to get together before Christmas, and they would make rock candy. They would give us scissors, and that was our job as kids. We had to cut it apart. And one time they made this green rock candy. And they, we were cutting it up, and it smelled, and we are like, Mom, what is this? Oh, it's anise. It's good. Try some. You try it. It's not good. It's bad. It's, it's just like, blah. After you got done, you're like, hey, give me one of those hot cinnamon ones. I'll eat that. It, it is prohibited, in fact, this, this absinthe is prohibited in many countries because of its alleged toxicity. It is synonymous with sorrow and great calamity. Moses warned that idolatry would bring sorrow to Israel like a root producing wormwood. Solomon warned that immorality might seem pleasant, but in the end, it produces bitterness like wormwood. People who drink from these waters are in danger of dying. What do you think is going to happen to the fish and all the other creatures that are living in the rivers and the lakes? And what about the vegetation? And most of you know I grew up in Michigan. I grew up in the town outside of Flint, but Flint River runs through the little town that I grew up in. Flint was known and has been on the news in the past because they poisoned the water through using lead pipe. This will be even worse. In fact, my nephew's son, even today, won't drink the water. And he, <clears throat> we were at the house with my, at, my, at my mom's and he was there and uh, we, we went to the faucet and got a filter and just kind of got some water out and, and drank it. And he's like, oh, you can't drink that. you got to drink out of a bottle. And we're like, mm, not going to happen. Um, there's a direct parallel here. That and the plagues of Egypt. However, after the exodus, Israel encountered bitter waters at Mara, which means bitter, and Moses had to purify the water supply. No... Um, 
human deaths have been mentioned in the first three trumpets. In the first two trumpets, excuse me. Although they undoubtedly will take a toll on human lives. But the third trumpet judgment, John records that many men died from the waters because they were made bitter. The rivers will run with deadly poison. The wells will become springs of death. The lakes and the reservoirs will be filled with toxic waters. People will be able to survive for a time. The destruction of food supply is caused by the first two trumpets. Uh, they'll be able to supply, uh, survive because they've stored provisions. But listen, people cannot survive long without fresh water. And the loss of this world's fresh water supply will cause wide, 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 wide world death. I don't know if they will hear Woody say somebody has poisoned the water hole. But the I'm glad you're here because you guys always laugh. I mean, you know, Fred has no clue what I'm talking about. Yeah. So the devastation caused by the first three trumpets will leave the world, the earth, and have in a state of shock. And fear. And yet God's not done yet. God's not done. Look at the fourth trumpet. Verse 12. Fourth angel sounded a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so a third of them were darkened, a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. The judgments for the first three affected only a third part of the land and waters, but this fourth judgment affects the entire world. This gets to the very source of the earth's life and energy that is the sun. With one-third less sunlight on the earth, there'll be one-third less energy to support the life systems of man and of nature. Let's be honest. How many of you are soul-powered? In other words, you are powered by the sun. If it's the sun's out, you're better off. If the sun's not out, forget it. That's my mom. That's me, man. I function better when the sun is out. Do you know, according to the, uh, the Farmer's Almanac, which is always right, kind of like the internet, <laughs> not, uh, according to the Farmer's Almanac, Virginia, West Virginia, has the sixth most overcast days in the year. Number one is Vermont. I'm sorry, number one is Washington, the state of Washington. Number two is Vermont. My home state, Michigan, is seventh, and as usual, Ohio is behind it. It's eighth. This judgment parallels the ninth plague in Egypt, where there was darkness for three complete days. Amos 5.18 says, the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. You think about the vast changes in temperatures that's going to occur. Years ago, uh, my mother-in-law and, and sister-in-law live out in um, live, lived and live in Arizona. My mother-in-law has passed away. My sister still lives. My sister-in-law still lives out there. And we went out, um, and we wanted to ride their four-wheelers. So they brought them up, and we were like riding them all over. And it was hot. It was really, really warm. Um, in about you know, about 6 o'clock, it started to get cooler as the sun was going down. I put a sweatshirt on, still using no gloves or anything, and still going around. And about an hour later, my hands were so cold. I was like, I didn't think it got cold in Arizona. But when the sun goes down, the temperature drops, it plummets. Can you imagine what it's going to do to the earth? One-third less sunlight less heat, no moon, no stars, one-third less of that to direct you and see you, uh, direct your path in the darkness. It's going to be huge changes. 
And it'll affect human mentality, human health, nature's growth will be affected. Two years ago when um, my two youngest grandchildren were born, one in South Carolina, the other one in Massachusetts, and we were gone away from home for a month. Um, Lisa has a plant that sits by the window. And I came home for just one weekend, and then I was going to go back up to Massachusetts, and that's when uh, Lainey was born in South Carolina, had her, all her problems. Um, but I was home for about three days before I had to leave. And I was told by the woman that I married that I should make sure that I watered that plant and open the window so it could get some sunlight. I failed. Plants need sunlight. And it's possible, uh, more likely it's possible that this judgment is temporary because we read in chapter 16, verses 8 and 9, and the, full, the fourth bowl judgment is going to reverse the effect of this because it's going to bring scorching heat with it. Um, but at the close of the tribulation period, we're also told that the sun and moon will be darkened to announce Jesus' return. Take your Bibles and turn to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. Verses 1 and 2. Charlie, if you can pull that up. There they are. Thank you, Charlie. So much quicker than we are. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. Verse 2, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. Darkness is going to come. And not only will nature suffer loss, but human nature will take, take advantage of the long darkness. And there will indul no doubt indulge in crime and in murdering each other and in all sorts of wickedness. Everyone that does evil, Jesus said, hates the light. Listen, it seems incredible that having experienced the fury of God's judgment and heard the message of salvation, people will stubbornly cling to their sin. But the sad truth is that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. The unbelieving world rejected Jesus when he came. And they rejected the message. Now they do that, and they will continue to reject it, even through the tribulation period, even during the future outpouring of his wrath and his judgment for those who repent of their sins and come to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed reality is they understand John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting. Look at verse 13. Verse 13 is an interesting verse. We'll close with this verse. He said, I looked and I heard an angel. Now, stop right there. Some of your Bibles do not say the word angel there. What did it say? An eagle. <laughs> Again, John is looking at this through first century eyes. 
okay? An angel, an eagle, which one is it? And when there are so many people out there who disagree and have a big argument about whether it's an eagle or an angel. Here's what I think it is. I think it's an angel because he's got a message. Angels are messengers of God. I think it's an angel that is soaring high above just like an eagle. It doesn't matter what you think it is or whether I'm wrong. I've been known to be wrong before. I get told that once in a while. And it's okay. Um, but here's the thing. He's got a message. And here's what happens to too, too many believers and unbelievers. We get so wrapped up in the messenger that we don't listen to the message. That's why so many people are like, well, I'm, I'm listening to him talk about Jesus, but I'm better than he is. Well, you might be better than he is by the world's standards, but you're better than he is by God's standards. Look at the aftermath. He has a message to the inhabitants of the earth, and it's a threefold message, and it's one word, woe, woe, Whoa. He's saying, you think this is bad. It's only going to get worse. God is going to send this creature, whether it's an angel or, the, or an eagle or whatever, I think it's an angel, on this special message, and he is saying to mankind, I am trying to get your attention. Listen. I've destroyed one-third of the earth. You need to repent. His message to the earth is, whoa. And people are like, well, God is really angry and mad. And No, God is showing them his grace. You say, well, how, how so? He is saying, pay attention, repent, because it is going to get worse. Here's my grace. He's doing the same thing he did to the people before Noah's day. Repent. Turn from your sin. Because greater judgment is coming. To the inhabitants of the earth. And that phrase, inhabitants of the earth, is found 12 times in Revelation. It means much more than people who live on the earth. That's where all living creatures reside. Instead, it refers to, all kind, to a kind of people, to those who live for the earth. See, I'm born again. I know Jesus is my personal Savior. I am living for him. There are too many people today who live for themselves. They live for their own pleasure, their own joy. They live for what they can get in this world. That's who he's talking to. When he talks about inhabitants of the earth or those people who live for this world, I'm living for Jesus, knowing that I am an alien headed to a better kingdom and a better place. Amen? I hope you are too. Look, he says, these people are not citizens of heaven. At the beginning of, of, of history, heaven and earth were united because Adam and Eve honored God and obeyed his will. Satan tempted them to focus on the earth, and they disobeyed God. And ever since, a great gulf has been fixed between heaven and earth. This chasm was bridged when the Son of God, Jesus, came to earth and died on a cross, paying for the sins of the whole world, and he died for you and I as well, because we're part of the whole world. Only those who believe, though, and receive his gift of eternal life by faith will enter into heaven. Everyone else will be left to face this on earth. 
Why is it so important that we tell other people that they, they don't need to go through this either? They may not be living for Jesus, but they do need Jesus. So you may ask, how long? How long do we have? I don't know. I don't know. We're not told. But here's what's going on. God is asking you, how long? How long will you not care about your neighbor if you don't know him? How long? Do you not care, care about those people who work with you? How long do you not care about your friends at school that you won't share Jesus with them? How long? How long will you go around playing Christian and not turn and trust him? How long will you act spiritual but your heart is evil? How long? Will you who are called by his name not humble yourself and pray and seek his face and turn from your wicked ways? How long will you judge your brother for the, for the speck in his eyes while you have a beam in your own? How long? How long will you deny him? Will you bow, your, bow in prayer with me? How long? Some of you may be asking the question, how long has it been since you spent time with him? How long has it been since you've considered his ways? The quietness of this moment, if you've never received Jesus as your personal Savior, the Bible tells us that when the rapture happens, if you don't know him as your Savior, you will be left behind. You'll be left behind to face all these things that we've been studying in Revelation 6 through 8. And it's only going to get worse. And I just wonder this morning if you would say, you know, the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. He's drawing me to him. And I, I, I need him. And in the quietness of this moment, you're asking, saying to him, just quietly say to God, God, confess to you that I am a sinner. I've broken your laws. The Bible tells us for all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. And I ask you to forgive me of those sins. I ask you to come into my life as I turn from my sins and turn to you. I ask you to save me The Bible tells us he accepts us right where we are. I believe that your son died for me, paid the price, took my sin. And I confess him as my Lord and Savior. Maybe you're here this morning and you are a believer. You know Jesus. There's some sin in your life. There, there's some issues that you're dealing with. And um, you need to repent. Maybe you're here and you just haven't been sharing the gospel. In a moment after I pray, we're going to all stand and play something over the through, the through the sound system as it is now. And God has spoken to your heart. The altar will be open. Just come to the altar and give it to him. God, have your way in our hearts. It's been one of those messages, Lord, that's hard to preach because it's truth. But it's not fun truth to preach, but it is, it is going to happen. Your word is true. It's a great warning. 
to the inhabitants of this earth. But Lord, I, I pray there would also be a great warning to those that are known by your name. That our time is short. That we have a job to do. And that job involves telling others as we go through our life about your love for this lost mankind on this earth. Because, Lord, no laws that we change or we put up in, in our world today is going to change the direction that we're going. The only thing that will change will be a, when we change and turn ourselves back, turn ourselves back to you and give ourselves back to you and allow you to change us and to work through us. So, Father, I pray that we, your people, here at Lighthouse, those who know you would turn from our evil and wicked ways and that we would repent and we would seek your face, knowing that you are a great and mighty God who saves securely and delivers. Father, we thank you for that. You stand with me as we play this over the loud, something over the loudspeaker, Charlie, and we'll, uh, over the PA, and we'll, uh, um, for the sound system, and uh, we'll open the altar up. Keep your head bowed, your eyes closed, be in prayer. God is speaking to your heart. Please come to the altar.
good and so great, and we love you, and we thank you that you loved us. May we share that love with others, in Jesus' name. A couple of announcements, small groups tonight at 5, ladies Bible study tomorrow night. Um, daycare graduation is coming up in a couple of weeks on May 19th, um, and that'll be on, on Sunday morning, so you all, you know, if you're here, you'll get to see it. If you're not here, you're going to miss out. Um, Secret Sister Reveal, May the 18th. Be sharing if you want to know more about that. Um, we've been having the clothing giveaway. They're going to do it also Monday and Tuesday. So if you know people who need clothes, send them our way. If you need clothes, come our way. Um, and then um, there's a couple other things in here. Next Saturday is the food pantry from 9 to 11. Um, we need your help for that. Uh, May 8th, that's this Wednesday, is Awana Awards. So we'll get to see our kids. Um, and get their, get their awards. May 10th, that's next Friday, there's going to be a movie called Breakthrough. Do you have a video on that? See what you can do. Uh, it's called Breakthrough. May 15th, is, yeah, I know, he's got a video out there, is uh, end of the year bash. Uh, so that's for the Iwana kids, and I've already told, talked to several of them about the fact is they can get each other, but the one they want to get the most is RJ. And he's like, I don't care. <laughs> they need to come dressed to get dirty. All right. And a towel and old clothes. All right. Uh, this, uh, we have a time to vote again. Uh, it's May 14th, so make sure you're voting and you're up to date and you know what's going on. There are some right to life um, brochures out there. Uh, that's for the hurricane area. If you live in the hurricane area, those are for you. If you don't live in that hurricane zip code, uh, you can go to right, WV Right to Life, and uh, you can pull off yours for your own zip code. You got it? 